speaker, board member Wendy Grassi. Wendy? Good afternoon, everyone. St. Petersburg has been undergoing a remarkable transformation from a sleepy town of retirees to a world-class destination recognized by national publications for its beauty and for its culture. What the city has badly needed is leadership to guide this transformation. Issues such as the new pier, midtown development, keeping the Tampa Bay Rays from moving, mediocre public schools and racial inequality and unrest have been left largely unaddressed. With the election of Mayor Rick Kreisman, the consensus is that there is a new day in Tampa Bay coming out of St. Pete City Hall. The new mayor says he wants Florida's fourth largest city to be run like the major metropolis that it is. He has promised to forge consensus and move the city forward. So far, he has begun by appointing caring and talented officials to attack the problems we face. Included in his hirings are some very dynamic women. This is, this is not surprising because when I was with Planned Parenthood and advocating in Tallahassee for women's reproductive freedom, there was no better champion and fighter for women's rights and choice than Representative Rick Kreisman. Our new mayor is caring and smart, and he is ambitious for all of us. Let's hear what his plans are. I'm very proud to introduce our new mayor, Rick Kreisman. Now, I was expecting to get skewered on the introduction, so I guess I have to wait a little bit until it's question time. Uh, good afternoon, members. It's good to be back here in the Tiger Den. Uh, I've been here many times as a candidate. Uh, I've been here as one of eight city council members, as one of 120 state representatives, and now I'm here as mayor, uh, and there's just one of me. And so the odds of me being carved up today have greatly increased. <laughs> but I wouldn't want it any other way. Uh, this is a great job. Uh, and it's made only greater by the opportunities that we have in front of us. The opportunity to build a new pier and to help shape our waterfront. Uh, and I'm really excited about the meetings that we've already had with members of the various groups who were involved in the waterfront talking about our plans and our process for going forward, trying to get their feedback so that we have an agreed upon process on the front end as opposed to trying to deal with things on the back end. The opportunity to pick a new leader for our police department. And we are currently uh, out in the field nationwide right now um, with a consultant that we hired to get names uh, so that we have both internal and external candidates to consider to make sure that we hire the best chief for the best department. The opportunity to revitalize our neighborhoods and recommit ourselves to small businesses. Uh, and I have tried to demonstrate the focus on our neighborhoods and small businesses by uh, hiring two very talented people, bringing back Mike Dove to be in charge of our neighborhoods, uh, and hiring uh, Jessica Eilerman to work with us uh, as our small business liaison. We have a tremendous opportunity to address inequalities that exist in our city, to lift up parts of South St. Petersburg in a sustainable manner by investing in people and not just in things. Progress has already been made on these and many other issues, and my administration is focused on Agenda 2020 and is working on funding opportunities to put many of those items in place so that we can move that issue forward. That is a major focus of this administration. And since January 2nd, our pier head has been reopened for residents and visitors to enjoy. And I'm amazed at the response. I think I've had more people that have come up to me and, and commented about reopening the pier than anything else I've done. The 
Pier parking lots we've established as fare-free zones to try and ease traffic and congestion and parking on Beach Drive. And our police department's chase policy has been tightened, as, as we now see the sheriff's has also been. I've joined with my peers all across the country to sign the Mayors Against Illegal Guns and to send a message, thank you, to send a message that St. Petersburg is not a place for gun violence. If you intend on using your gun for violent, for violent purposes, you're not welcome here. Go somewhere else. We don't want you. Uh, and we've also uh, showcased two new drug sniffing dogs, the first of their kind in the country. And I'm especially proud that one of them came from Southeastern Guide Dogs. And if you know anything about me, you know that uh, that is a place that has a very special place in my heart. We've unveiled a renewable energy project at our city's most popular pool. And we have named our city's first director of sustainability and green initiatives. We've kicked off a small business tour and recently held a successful small business town hall meeting. And we've established an end game to our red light camera program that's been so controversial. We also opened up two city hall satellite offices to provide better access to our residents. And these are just a few of the highlights. And this is all happening while the story of a St. Petersburg on the cusp is being told by the New York Times and by London newspapers and many others about what a great city we have here. And it's also being told by me and by my talented deputy mayor who's in the back of the room, Dr. Kanika Tomlin. And I have to tell you, I am so thrilled to have her on board and a part of this team. We are very fortunate as a city to have someone as talented as Dr. Tomlin that is so committed to seeing this city grow. Both Dr. Tomlin and I recognize that part of our job is to be a cheerleader and an advocate. That's part of the reason why we went to Washington last, meet, last week to meet with Vice President Biden and members of our congressional delegation. It's why I was there in December to meet with President Obama and other cabinet officials. In this day and age, we simply cannot afford to lose the race for attention and for resources. I'm proud to say I believe the sun is shining once again on this great city. I, thank you. I think our future is bright. Uh, and I am ready to take on your questions, and, uh, and then I'll make some closing comments. So I want to open it up and give you all as much time as you want to ask your questions. Uh, and I caught them by surprise, they weren't ready. Used to typical politicians who like to talk and talk and talk. I'm a, I know, I'm going to call on Hazel first. Hazel. Hazel, uh, uh, I would like to know if you today have rising, uh, which of these two events is a greater economic impact that is brings in more money. Uh, the wonderful uh, cultural offerings, uh, the museums, all around us, or the Grand Prix. Well, that's a great question. <laughs> yeah, and. and um, you know, I, and it's interesting because I just came from, before I came here, I was at the TDC meeting, a Tourist Development Council. And one of the reports we got was from uh, the member of the TDC who works in Latin, who focuses on Latin America. And they just came back from spending uh, several days in Latin America. And one of the things they talked about was the Grand Prix. Uh, and a lot of the countries there were not familiar with the Grand Prix and were very excited about the Grand Prix and were coming here for the Grand Prix. Uh, and it's going to be on live ABC television this year. So I love the Grand Prix. I'm a huge fan of the Grand Prix. But having said that, um, I believe the renaissance that's occurred in the city of St. Petersburg is because of our cultural amenities. It's our shops, our galleries, our museums, our live performing arts like Free Fall out in my area. It's, it, we are a city that is blessed with incredible cultural opportunities. Uh, and I think it's what's put us on the map and will continue to put us on the map. Um, 
I love the Grand Prix and, and I know where you're going with that. And I think, it's, I think it's important that we work really hard to try and make things that, are, that benefit the city coexist. To try and find a place where we can have the Grand Prix without it negatively impacting our cultural amenities or our local businesses. I believe we can get there. I'm committed to us getting there because having that visual of this beautiful city broadcast to hundreds of countries around the world is, we can't pay for that. So I, I want to see that continue, um, but I love the Dali too. <laughs> You know, I, I think, quite frankly, I think to be a, a Superman, to be a, and to me that's just somebody who's a leader. Um, to be a really good leader, uh, there's a couple things you have to do, I believe. You, you have to surround yourself with really smart, talented people, uh, and you have to empower them, uh, not only to do their jobs, but to tell you if they think that you're not doing yours well. Uh, and I think that's something I've done. If you look at the people that we brought on board, um, and you know, I've got a couple of them in the back of the room and there's a number of them at City Hall. They are really talented people. Uh, and they've been empowered to not only do their jobs, but to say to me, hey, Mr. Mayor, that's not a good idea. We need to rethink that. And I think that's important. Um, so I think you need to do that. And the other thing that I think is, is critical to being that Superman, that good leader, is to be a good listener. Uh, and somebody who's willing to listen, willing to consult, consider points of view that uh, are different than their own, um, because that's how you, get, you come to consensus, um, and that's how you, know, you, you embrace new ideas. Uh, so I, I wouldn't say I'm, I'm Superman. I like to think and, and hope that I'm going to be a good leader, and I think I've started off, I hope, on the right good foot by, by bringing in some very talented people and going out and listening to this community and to what the needs and the wants and the desires are. Uh, on the 76th day of your uh, administration, can you tell us what two of the most important changes that you've affected since you took office and how those would impact the quality of life for citizens here in St. Pete, as well as the workplace environment for the employees? Yeah, uh, you know, one of, the th one of the first things that I did uh, after taking office, and thank you for that question, is I called a meeting together of all my top administrators, uh, my directors, and my managers. And what I said to them was, I felt was very important, and that is that we need to have a change in the culture of City Hall. Uh, because if we're going to expect the community's culture to change, and I think we need to change the culture of the community, and I'll, I'll explain that in a minute, we need to change the culture of City Hall first. Uh, and that starts with no longer tolerating the first response to a question of no. No cannot be our first response. It should be our last response. If there's a problem in the community that's brought to us, we need to try and figure out how to solve it instead of saying, nope, sorry, we can't do that. So I stress the importance of getting away from no and defining solutions to problems. Uh, I also stress the importance of being innovative and creative and thinking outside the box. And, and, and going by the, the theory, no longer accepting the theory, I should say that just because it's how we did it is the way we need to keep doing it. It may have worked before the way we did it, but that doesn't mean it's the best way to do it. Uh, and we should never settle for being uh, complacent at success. We should be always striving to be even more successful than, than we are. Uh, and then the third piece that I thought was very important to share with, with my uh, directors and managers and administrators was the importance of family. And by that I mean the people that work for the city, there's been people that have done their jobs before. There will be people that will do their jobs when they're gone, but their family, family only has one of them. And if they're not taking care of their family uh, and they're not addressing those needs at home, they can't come to work and give me 110%. So I wanted to make sure that everyone on my staff knew that that was important to me too, that they take care of their family. So that when they come to work, they're focused on their jobs. So if we change those things, I think it's going to have a significant impact. The, 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 the last piece, that, and we're going to roll this out in a couple weeks, is a vision. 
We're going to have a vision for the direction that we're going as a community, a vision that's guided by our values, with, that has specific goals and strategic pathways to get, that, to get there, and you will see that in a couple weeks, and we're very excited about it. Yes, ma'am. Shirley Bassett. Um, St. Petersburg kind of goes a lot of different places, a lot of neighborhood organizations, but there's the Skyway Marina District. What are your future plans for that? And if you have none, why not? Thank you, Shirley, and I'm so used to seeing you with the red, white, and blue bandana. <laughs> um, the Skyway Marina District and, and 34th Street, I think, are tremendous opportunities that we have as a community because when you look at St. Petersburg, um, so much of the city is already built out and there's not a lot of land available for development, but there is on 34th Street and in particular in the Skyway Marina District. And to me, that's why I think it's so exciting the potential that that district has. Um, council has gone ahead and already has fun put some funding in place for a position to serve as kind of like the Main Street Director. Um, economic Development is working with uh, very closely with um, the, the, the folks behind the Skyway Marina District, we have been meeting with some businesses out there and uh, as I've said to my economic development team, you tell me where I need to go and when I need to be there, uh, I'm willing to do whatever it takes to bring businesses to that district. Um, and uh, there's some big opportunities I think that we have out there and I'm really anxious to get that going because it, but it's all of South St. Pete, it isn't just the 34th Street Corridor and it isn't just the Skyway Marina District. You know, I'm, I'm thrilled that Trader Joe's is coming here. Uh, I'm, I got tired of driving down to Sarasota. But quite frankly, I would have preferred to see Trader Joe's locate on 62nd and MLK South. And I say that because that area is in desperate need of, of having shopping centers and retail and, and all the things that we take for granted that in other parts of the city. And the other thing that area needs is they need a draw like that to bring people from other areas of the city into there. That's the only way we're going to start breaking down the perceptions that exist in this community. And that's, that's the culture that I was talking about that we need to change. We need to break those perceptions down that when you cross Central Avenue, uh, it's still safe. We need to get to that place. And we're not there yet. Uh, and, and bringing businesses to Skyway Marina District, uh, to that area on 62nd, to 54th Avenue, uh, and into Midtown, that's going to make the difference. Yes, ma'am. Willie Radarski, what challenges and opportunities does Rick Messick's resignation offer you? Ah. Yeah, good question. And I'm, uh, I understand Rick's wanting to, uh, to retire. Uh, I wish he didn't. Um, Rick brings tremendous history, knowledge, uh, competence, integrity, honesty. Uh, I could go on and on. Anybody who's ever dealt with Rick Mussett knows that this is a guy who loves the city of St. Petersburg, uh, put in just ridiculous hours, which I I'm surprised, quite frankly, he didn't burn out long ago um, because of the hours that this guy puts in on behalf of us here in the city. Uh, so. It's huge, huge shoes to fill. Uh, and the biggest challenge is bringing in someone who can, whether it's from the inside or outside, who can jump in and fill those shoes, who can be that negotiator, that, that tough negotiator that we need in that department, who knows the city, knows what the needs are, uh, and has that ability to communicate that uh, and do it with accountability, integrity, uh, and uh, uh, transparency. And that's tough. Uh, so that's not going to be an easy, I'm not going to kid anyone in this room, that's not going to be an easy position to fill. Um, you know, uh, Rick has graciously offered uh, to lend a hand anytime I need it, uh, but uh, I think he's, he's real interested in spending some time with his family and I can't blame him. Uh, it's a big loss. Uh, but we will, we will do our best to make sure that we bring in someone, uh, again, either from the inside or outside, that is uh, extremely competent and that I have complete confidence in, um, and uh, so I, I'm excited about that opportunity. Uh, there's definitely trepidation there, but Jim? Jim Gillespie, I'd like to revisit South St. Petersburg, the African American community where you're trying to bring in uh, stores and so forth. Uh, the efforts don't come easily. You've got to have a market, you've got to have income, education. 
Now, income and jobs and education are related. Can you tell this group what your strategies are for linking those up so that the Walmarts, Trader Joe's would be attractive there? Because you're talking about a lot of people. It's got one of it's got the most popular space in history, uh, zip code in in this city. What can you do that your predecessors have failed to do? Uh, it, it is it's, it is a big challenge. Um, I, I met actually before, this morning at 7 a.m. I had a meeting with Dr. Grego, um, who I am every day am more and more impressed with, and I think we are very fortunate to have him. Uh, as our school superintendent, because this guy is really committed to making a difference. Uh, and he and I both are committed from an education standpoint to really focusing on that gap that exists, and in particular on African Amer American males. Um, we want to bring up the education and give opportunities to that segment in particular. Um, so there are some things that we're, we're looking at doing. One of the things, and I talked about it a lot on the campaign trail, that I still am very interested in, and I talked to Dr. Grego a little bit about this today, was, was service learning. Um, I'm a big believer in trying to utilize service learning to change the environment of the classroom. Um, and we are uh, having some discussions with Eckerd College, which is in South St. Pete, and you know, people forget about that institution, but that's a great school. Uh, and they have an office of service learning, and we're real interested in potentially partnering with them. Uh, but it's, it's also bringing not the, just the Walmarts and the Trader Joe's jobs, but it's the Loomis Dream jobs and the, and the high paying jobs that we need to bring uh, to Midtown and, and to South St. Pete. And that's why apprenticeship academies are going to be very important. And we are working on trying to get some funding uh, to, to work with our building trades and create these pr apprenticeship academies. There's some good paying jobs out there in, in, some, in trades, whether it's plumbing or electrical workers or carpenters or masoners, um, those are opportunities that we can bring, and in particular to that segment that's often ignored and shouldn't be, which are the offenders, who are really tough and having a hard time getting jobs. That's a real opportunity for those folks uh, to get a job, and a good paying job is to get a good skill that makes them employable. So it's a combination. Health is important too. We don't want to forget about the health of the community. Uh, from providing good quality food that's healthy and getting away from fast foods to making sure people have insurance and the Affordable Care Act can help in that respect. And, and I ran out of time to answer that question. Dave. David Barger. Um, I think you have uh, jumped into the shoes of the mayor very well, like I made you. Uh, but I'd like to put you in the shoes of the owner of the Tampa Bay Rays. And I'd like to know, as the owner, where do you think you'd be playing baseball? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I should be able to read the owner's mind a little better since he got his head shaved, and so there's not as much blocking the, the thoughts, but, um, and that was cool that he did that. But, um, you know, we, we, uh, we've already had our, our initial conversation since uh, I was sworn in. We're, we're scheduling additional conversations. Uh, to talk about the future of the team. We've kind of agreed, uh, mutually agreed, that our discussions are going to remain between us uh, so that we can make some progress. We want to, I want to make sure that there is a level of trust between uh, he and I, uh, because uh, what I've always said, and I, I truly believe this, it's hard to have meaningful negotiations if you don't trust the person sitting on the other side of the table from you. Um, so I'm gonna, we're going to continue to talk about the future of this team, and my focus is going to be to continue to protect the taxpayers, try and honor the taxpayers by keeping the team here, try and honor those people who gave up their homes and their businesses, not by their own choice for that stadium to be built, by keeping the team here. Uh, but my focus right now is on this coming season, as is his, and I think we're in for quite a ride. I think this team's going to do incredible. So uh, I look forward to uh, attending playoff and World Series games in October at Tropicana Field, and hopefully all of you will join us. Rebecca Falkenberry, I'm really glad to hear that you've appointed a sustainable and green director. I'm assuming that's Mike Hunter. It is. I'd like to know, uh, as far as environmental initiatives, what you think we can be doing that are both sustainable, makes the city greener, and are economically viable that will bring jobs. 
And could you remind me how many miles of coastline St. Petersburg has that are vulnerable to sea level rise? Well, it's, I'll, I'll answer that last question by saying it's more than just the downtown. And there's, there always seems to be a focus on, on the downtown and for good reason. But we've got a lot of neighborhoods all throughout the city, whether it's, it's out in uh, Pinellas Point or out in Yacht Club Estates, that all uh, are right on that water and are all vulnerable. And um, this administration is very committed to paying attention and doing some long-term planning when it comes to sea level rise. Um, we are looking at a number of different things. I mentioned before that what, uh, the, the initiative we did at North Shore Pool uh, with both uh, geothermal and solar. Uh, we are in conversations with Duke Energy about uh, LED traffic signals, uh, which I, I think is very important that we need to do. Um, we are always going to be looking for ways, whether it's um, uh, through urban gardening, and I believe that's a part of the sustainability piece that's very important, in addition to the, to the health piece that we were talking about, uh, Jim, with um, you know, Midtown and making sure people are healthy so that they can go to work and they can go to school. Uh, and um, so we're going to be working on, on those initiatives, and, uh, and I'm looking forward to trying to get uh, our Secretary of Agriculture down here, uh, Secretary Vilsack, to talk about urban gardening. Um, uh, so we are clearly focused on, on these issues. Uh, I, I would personally like to also see us put in place, and I haven't had an opportunity to meet with some of our lending institutions yet, but one of the things I'd love to see us get to is where every one of us in, the home, in this room that are homeowners have an opportunity to get a low interest loan uh, to uh, green our homes uh, and then use those savings to pay off that loan. Uh, we, we do it for commercial businesses, but I'd love to see every homeowner have that opportunity and I'd like to see some of our lo local lending institutions step up to provide that. Uh, but it's going to take everybody in the community working together uh, I think, and curbside recycling is a big piece of that, and that's coming. I'm very excited about that. That's long overdue, so great opportunities. All the way in the back, trying to look all around. Harvey Vanders. Cruise ships now are based in Tampa. Uh, there's been some talk or wishful thinking about cruise ships possibly being on this side of the Scully Bridge. Do you really see that as realistic? Well, when you look at the, the designs of the new cruise ships, um, it's going to really force the issue because uh, the, the newer ships just won't fit under the Skyway. So our port, if it's going to continue, the Port of Tampa, is, if it's going to continue to be uh, a destination for cruise ships, it means that it's going to be a destination for older cruise ships, not the newest uh, and the greatest and latest. So uh, I think for that reason, um, the industry is going to have no choice but to look for alternatives. They don't want to lose this market because it's a good market uh, for loading and unloading of, of cruise ship passengers. So then the question becomes where does it go? Um, does it go to the port of St. Petersburg or, or near the port or does it go to the port of Manatee or near that port? Obviously I like to see it come here. Uh, I think it could certainly be a boom to uh, the Skyway Marina District potentially, because it would be in South St. Petersburg and in that area. Um, but I, I don't think the industry is going to have a choice. They're either going to have to, at some point in time, write off this area, or they're going to have to find uh, alternatives, because the ships just aren't going to be able to get under that bridge. Mr. Mayor, I don't know what you think it's going to be. Name Terry Bryant. Uh, my question deals with, uh, and the former mayor, the question was raised on the amount of money being spent by uh, police department of people taking cars outside of St. Petersburg. So my concern is, uh, do you see yourself following what the sheriff of Bound Upper Stallion is doing, having them reimburse the city uh, for the amount of money that they're spending going outside, which I think was estimated about $300,000? You know, and, and that's a good question. I was asked this question a lot during the campaign, and, and my response then is really the same as it is today, which is, um, you know, we're, we're going to look at everything. Uh, and you have to when you're looking at a budget, uh, especially when we have some of the challenges that we're still facing and we have some of the priorities that we want to start investing in, um, and we've got to find the resources to do that. So we're going to look at everything, but it isn't going to be just for the police department. Uh, it, to me, it's not fair to just signal the signal 
single, excuse me, the police department out because there are other take-home vehicles uh, in other departments in the city. So we're going to look at all of them and we're going to look at it and see does it make sense to allow the program to continue as it, as it is or do we need to make changes to it and if we're going to make changes what are going to be the repercussions of those changes? Is it going to have an impact on our ability to uh, retain employees or to recruit in new employees? We have to weigh all of those factors but uh, nothing is off the table. We are going to look at all of that, but I don't want to just single them out. I want to look at it uh, citywide at all of the take-home vehicles. All the way in the back, Ray. Thanks. Uh, Ray Moore. You just talked about small businesses. St. Petersburg, Tampa Bay Times, so long call that, had an article about a business having a very hard time opening down on Central. My friend Nikki, who just opened up Nikki's Cafe and Organics on Central, right across from the municipal building, he described the headaches to go through with all the inspectors, the bureaucrats, to get open. What can you do on that? And, and that is a real problem. And, and uh, you know, I, I said during my inaugural address that I felt like the city rolls out the red carpet for big business and the red tape for small business. Uh, and that that was something we need to change. And that's, that really is part of the reason that we brought um, Jessica on board, uh, to be that conduit between the business community and my office to let us know about issues that are going on. We've already gone on three small business tours and it's been fantastic because we've, we've learned a lot that we hadn't heard before about things that we're doing right, but more importantly about things that we're not doing right that we need to fix. Um, you know, and, and what, what always, what, what bothers me is when I hear, and I talked about this as part of changing the culture, well, but that's what the code is, we're just enforcing the code. Well, if the code's not working, if it's making it difficult, then we need to change the code. Uh, we need to make those changes so that we're not stifling businesses um, and, we're, and they're not just merely surviving, we want them to be thriving. Um, and I'm, I'm hearing those things and we're looking at a lot of different issues based on the feedback that we've gotten. And what we, are, we want to encourage everyone is if, if you are an owner of a small business or you know someone is and they're experiencing a challenge, we want to hear it. Because that's the only way we can address it and try and fix it is if we know about it. Um, and we are paying attention and we are going to make changes because in my mind, you know, you can go to communities all over the country, you can find your Targets, your Walmarts, all of those big box stores everywhere. But what you can't find is that small business, uh, you know, whether it's Central Perk or it's uh, Broody Licious or any of these places that exist in this community that give us our really special feel uh, and that make this community what it is. And, and we don't want to lose them because that's who's employing our residents, that's who's paying the taxes in this community. I'm Gregory Wilson. Uh, first of all, congratulations, Rob. Thank you. It is a new day in St. Petersburg. But as we look back at the last two election cycles, the primary and the general election, not just your election, uh, it was unprecedented on any number of measures. What did you learn from that experience and how does it influence how you look forward before we get to the next election cycle? Good question. And, and I have to say, uh, you know, and the people that know me uh, commented during this last campaign how, how much fun I seemed to be having, and they were kind of surprised by that because campaigns aren't often fun. Uh, and my response was, I'm having fun because I've met so many really wonderful, nice people. Uh, and this community is just really filled with good people. Um, so uh, that, that's something I, that was kind of reaffirming. But what I also learned, and, and I, I talk a lot about this story, uh, and it does, it had a profound impact on me, it was the gentleman whose door I knocked on and who told me he can't find a job because he's a convicted felon who's trying to turn his life around. He's getting his GED and he can't get a job. Um, you know, and that had a profound effect and we have to deal with that. We have to make changes. Um, but the other thing that I think this election signaled was that this is a, it is a new day and the sun is shining on this community again. And um, we are a progressive city. Um, and we are, we have huge opportunities and people in this community are excited. I heard a lot about that. People in the city, aside from the fact that they're good people, they love this city. 
uh, you know, and you can't do what I do if, uh, on a daily basis if you're not feeling that love, and I'm feeling it. And it's amazing, and it keeps me going every day. I have people say, how do you have the energy you have? It's because I'm fueled by the community. Uh, and I mean that sincerely. This is a great city, and we have huge opportunity. And to me, that's so exciting. And the people seem to be really excited about the opportunities that we have here, that we can be on par and be known as, as, as a community equal to Austin and equal to Portland and Seattle and places like that. That we can be just as cool, if not cooler, than them. And I, I really believe that. And so, I do. Uh, you know, you don't set your goals high, you don't ever reach them. I'm not just saying that because I'm in this room. If you took me and we, we were out having a glass of wine, I'd be saying the same thing. I, I'm excited about this community. I really am. So, uh, yeah, Gary, I'm trying to go all around the room, making it difficult for you. Don't we want to see her run back and forth? Gary Stemensky, and uh, thank you for your service. You have a great plan. Uh, I love your attitude, and I think you're off on the right track. I do staff together, a little bit of a brain drain with the uh, Alston and and he has some challenges ahead in August, always an unexpected event. My central question is deficit. We've learned about two million plus uh, deficit. What are your plans to close that year? And let me first say that, that that deficit isn't, while it looks on paper like it's two million, uh, it really isn't because there's some funds that, first off, haven't been transferred. Um, and, and that's a deficit that unfortunately I inherited. Uh, it came with the job. Uh, but it's my job to close it. And um, what, what's interesting, if, if you look at the numbers, is that the amount that we're, we're spending is right on target. It's not, so it's not a problem that we're spending more than, we're, than, than we budgeted. It's that the revenue projections after one quarter, and let's be very clear, it's only after one quarter, uh, the revenue projections have been lower than expected. So that's really why you're seeing the deficit numbers that you're seeing. We expect that to change. Uh, and speaking with my budget director, and I have uh, complete faith in, in Tom, um, they're expecting that to change, and we're also asking departments, and we're challenging departments, uh, to look for ways to uh, cut the amount of their budget spending. Uh, and we're convinced that if, and we've set a, a target of a minimum of 1%, but we want to we wanna reward those who exceed that, and actually departments that um, do the best, we want to we wanna recognize them for their efforts. So we're challenging them. Uh, see what you can do. See how creative you can get. See how efficient you can get. Um, and I, I'm, I'm absolutely convinced we're going to close that gap, that that's not going to be our problem, that the biggest challenge we're going to have is going into the next budget cycle to make sure that the things that are important, that we can start addressing Agenda 2020 and those things, that we have the resources to do that. Um, I think that's going to be, in some ways, the bigger challenge that we have while still trying to maintain, if not re uh, build up our reserves. So, Mr. Marger. Congratulations, Mayor. Thank you. Did uh, Mayor and Bruce Marger, did Mayor and Council make an error in the removal of the red light cameras? Tampa seems to think so. Uh, we hate them. They bothered us. We, they worried us. They gave us whiplashes. However, they saved lives. We are here for life, protection, and safety. They should not be looked at solely on a financial basis. A study should be made. Let me, let me be very clear when it comes to red light cameras. Is, uh, for me, as the mayor of the city, it was never about finance. I could care less about the revenues. What I talked about, and when I made my suggestion to council, uh, that we look at September potentially as a time if we're going to remove the cameras to remove them, was when does it reach that point where the program isn't even neutral in its cost, but the program is costing us money? And the only way you get to that point where the program is now costing you money is because the number of citations being issued has decreased to such an extent that it's not generating any kind of revenues to even pay for itself. And that's a good thing. Ultimately, that's what you want to see happen with the program is you want to see the behaviors change so people aren't running red lights, they're not being issued citations, and there's no money coming into the program. 
September is when we anticipate that the program would start costing us money and that the behaviors would change to such a degree that that's where it would hit. So what I said to council was, I'm confident, I'm, I'm, I'm convinced that come September, when we hit that point, that we've sufficiently changed behaviors to that point where we can go ahead and take the cameras down. However, we're going to continue to monitor not only those intersections, but all intersections. And if we see the behavior come back, then I'm going to bring it back to council. But I will say this, if I do bring it back to council, we need to make sure that the concerns that were raised by some in the community have been addressed so that we get rid of those concerns, uh, that there's no question about the technology or the timing of lights, uh, and so that we have confidence in the program. Because I, I agree with you, the program has worked. We've seen decreases in injuries from, from accidents caused by red light running. We've seen decreases in fatalities. Uh, and that's a good thing for this community. So, do last, I, last question. Do I have time to make a quick closing after? One quick question. One quick question, one quick closing. Um, that gentleman in the far back. John Hamilton. We seem to be hell bent to tear down up here. Instead of having a bridge out there, why not have a causeway? The causeways have been used since biblical times. You don't have to replace it every 40 years. You put whatever you want to on top of it. You put some tubes through there with generators and let the tide make continuous electricity. 24 hours a day for years and years. And so something is well within the budget. Carry down the end of the week, we might do some of that problem. Um, well, I'm not, I'm not sure what the question was, but I'll, 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 let me say this, and, and, I, and, and I appreciate your comments. We are, this process that we're working on, and um, we'll announce the formal process once we have consensus from all the folks that are, have been involved before, but we're going to engage the community on both the front end and the back end, talking about wanting to know what you as a community want the structure or whatever it is out there to do, because I think we have to be very clear on what we want it to do. We know how much money we have to spend, but we have to be clear on what we want it to do. And then on the back end as to what it looks like. And the community will have an opportunity to weigh in on that too. Uh, but I appreciate your, your statement. And if I may just in, briefly in closing, uh, I want to encourage all of you, and, and this is my time to, to do an ask of all of you. Uh, I want to encourage all of you to do a few things. Um, we have race weekend coming up. We hope everyone in this community will embrace the race come out, whether it's on Friday, Saturday, or on race day Sunday. Support the race. Um, the visuals are wonderful. We want to keep them here. There are those who are vying to take them away from our community, and we want them to stay here. We want to make sure that you show up for opening day of the race and every game after that. So please, if you haven't bought your ticket for opening game, please go out and do that. Support this team. They put a great product on the field. They deserve our support. Uh, and the last thing I want to mention to you is Beginning on April 6th from 1 to 6 p.m., the, uh, the Saturday morning market that you love is going to be moving to Sundays. It's still going to be on Saturday, but on Sundays, it's going to be out on the deuces. And we want everyone to come out to the deuces for the Sunday morning market from 1 to 6 p.m. on 22nd Street. Please come out and join us at their shop. Take advantage of it. Support it. Uh, and I thank you all so much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and as a token of our appreciation, I don't think you were carved up too badly. But, um, and now the winner of the coveted tiger, Hazel Huff. No surprise there. Hits me right out of the box. That was a good one. You've been listening to live event coverage on RadioStPete.com of the Suncoast Tiger Bay Club Luncheon here on the 19th of March. Program came to you live from the St. Petersburg Yacht Club in St. Petersburg, Florida on RadioStPete.com. The next scheduled Tiger Bay Club Luncheon